welcome back to another episode of Planet Hunters Coffee Chat. I'm Cassie Prolongo, and of course, joining me is the amazing Nora Eisner. Good to see you, Nora. Good to see you too, Cassie. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Um, as many of you have known, because I hope that you've been watching our show, I have. I wasn't here for a couple of episodes. I was on holiday. Um, I was actually overseas, ate way too much food, <laughs> um, kept up the theme of coffee chat by drinking quite a lot of coffee and tea. Um, yeah, so I had a great time, um, but it's really good to be back and it's good to see you and it's great to talk about science. I missed it. I missed talking about science with you. So um, <laughs> I'm excited you're back. <laughs> thank you. And a special shout out to Cole Johnston. You did an amazing job. It was really cool to see you as guest host. And we may do this more in the future. I mean, because we're going to want to take holidays and we might do breaks. So look for us in the future to have either guest hosts to come. We may invite some people to come on and do some presentations too. So cool things are happening. It's going to be fun. I'm looking forward to it, Nora. Mm, me too. <laughs> But it was great because with Cole, he was all about stars and you, of course, are all about planets. So it was a nice symbiotic relationship between you two. <laughs> or a rivalry. That. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> a friendly, friendly rivalry. <laughs> Which is the better one? But for Planet Hunters tests, I mean, it's it's important. You need both. So this sparked up, I think, a good conversation that we had. We were talking about what, what do we want to do for future ones? And we thought, well, let's let's go into this. Let's talk a little bit about star variability or differences of stars and how this can affect light curves, how this can affect the things that you guys, citizen scientists, are helping to actually classify. So let's kick this off, Nora. Let's talk about cool stuff with stars, which I think will make Cole very happy. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. <laughs> let's hope he watches it. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, but it's, as you said, it's really important to talk about stars um because when we have a planet they have to be going around a star uh so it's important to understand understand that star that that we're looking at yes. um so I I like that friendly rivalry <laughs> <laughs> yeah sure it's friend no <laughs> science <laughs> it's just what science is um so when we look up at the night sky we see all of these stars and when you just look at them they all look quite similar but actually they all have uh, lots of different properties and the properties that they have the kind of the how hot they are how big they are how heavy they are these all affect the light curve that we end up seeing and because of that it's good to understand the stars that we are looking at so one way to that we like to classify stars is into their temperatures it's yes. into kind of these hotter stars and the colder stars so the stars that you're seeing here you can already see you can see some blue ones, you can see some white ones, you can see some red ones, and these represent the temperatures of these stars. So we have the, the really hot ones, these are the blue ones, blue things tend to be, sorry, hot things tend to be more blue, and then we have the red ones, which tend to be the cooler ones. So one way to imagine this is if you have a campfire. If you have yeah. a campfire and you have a flame, that flame, if you look really carefully, is blue at the bottom. That's the hottest part. And it gets more yellow and then more red at the top. And that's the cooler part. And that's the same with stars. These are the kind of the colors that we see represent the temperatures of them. So if yeah. we take all of these stars and we can sort them into their temperatures, and you can see that happening now, we have the blue ones on the left and we have the red ones, the hotter, sorry, the cooler ones on that on the right. And once we've sorted them into, into the colors, we like to sort them into their brightness. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, we get this lovely pattern that looks like this. So I'm going to pause that here and say that on the right, we have the colder stars. On the left, we have the hotter stars. At the top, we have the bright stars. And at the bottom, we have the fainter stars. And what we can see is we can see this lovely sequence of them going right through the middle. We have this sequence along here. The reason I'm calling it sequence, which might seem like a weird word, is because in science, we call this the main sequence. Mm -hmm. And stars spend vast majority of their life on this main sequence. Around 95% of their entire life is spent on this main sequence until when they get older, they move off this main sequence. These stars up here, these are the older stars. Um, but that's, that's where they go as they age. Okay, so where exactly do our, does our sun fall then on this main sequence? Yeah, that's a really good question. And actually, I have a, another version of this plot uh, that you can hopefully see now where we can see the location of the sun and you can see it marked on by that 
that star there and you can see kind of where it falls on that main sequence our, our star is still in the kind of middle aged we'll call it the middle aged phase of its life uh, so it's still on that main sequence it hasn't moved off and zoomed off to become one of those much larger stars in the top right hand corner um, and the reason why I'm showing you this figure here this uh, we call it a HR diagram it's the Hertzsprung Russell diagram uh, it's because the light curves look different depending on the properties of the star. So depending on where that star falls on this diagram. On this diagram, the HR diagram. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, and that relates directly to the light curves that everybody gets to see as citizen scientists. Gotcha. All right. Yeah, exactly. So um, if we take, for example, small stars, if we take small, cold stars, these fall down here. I say cold. They're still around 2,500 <laughs> to 5,000 Kelvin, so roughly degrees Celsius. So they're still really, really hot, but we call them cold because they're still. Right. They'll still melt your uh, marshmallows using the campfire analogy. Sorry, I had to go there. They'll still <laughs> melt your marshmallows. Yeah, okay. <laughs> they will still definitely set them on fire. <laughs> Didn't you miss me, Nora? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I did miss you. Um, yeah. So those stars, these cooler stars, they are very active on their surface. And because they are so active on their surface, they have what we call flares. So they have, you can see a light curve here. This is of a cold um, kind of faint star. And you can see it has these spikes of, of kind of increased in light. So these are flares. This is where our sun has these occasionally too. Um, there are sudden bursts in brightness. It's due to magnetic field lines on the surface getting all tangled up and then snapping free and releasing lots of energy. Um, so seeing these kind of increases in brightness, these flares is very, very common for those colder stars. Right. Now, if we move up to kind of the other end of of this HR diagram, if we start looking at the much larger stars, larger stars tend to come in binaries or even higher order multiples. So triple systems, quadruple systems, lots of stars moving around one another. It's a common kind of um, properties of larger stars. So an example of that would be this target here. We can see an eclipsing binary here with another signal. This actually happens to be a triple system. Uh, so three stars, three very large stars orbiting around one another, um, in this case, very rapidly. May I ask a very silly question? There are no silly questions, but go on. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Just give me a minute and I could ask a silly question. Um, so it, can this be problematic for citizen scientists and maybe thinking when they see something like that, um, oh, maybe I've discovered a planet or something along those lines when it could have been just a binary star system um, through that? Uh, no, that's a great question. Yeah, so, um, so the main difference between, or a good way to tell whether something is an eclipsing binary or a transit event is that in an eclipsing binary, you expect alternating transit events to have different depths. Um, for a planet, you expect when the planet comes around every time, the planet has exactly the same size coming around every time. So it blocks exactly the same amount of light every time. You expect the transit depth to be very consistently the same. Whereas for an eclipsing binary, you have, if you imagine you have two different sized stars and sometimes the bigger star is blocking the light from the smaller star and sometimes the smaller star is blocking the light from the bigger star. Um, and depending on which one, which star is blocking the light from the other star, a different amount, you see that these events, these um, eclipses to be different depths and those would alternate. So that would be kind of a signature of an eclipsing binary. Gotcha. Okay. Now another thing about eclipsing binary, depths are also much, much deeper. So oh. because planets are much smaller than stars, the amount of light that that a star, sorry, that a planet blocks is much smaller than the amount of light that a star blocks. Um, so you can see these are quite deep. It'd be nice if we had a comparison. A transit event from a planet would be much, much shallower. Okay, thank you for explaining that. And I'm sure we have some previous episodes too to also check out to talk a little bit more about these things and some other bits. So not to get off track. Thank you for answering my question, Nora. Um, okay. I should point out, these are only examples of the types of light curves you expect for different ends of the HR diagram. There is no recipe for, for a star or a light curve at yeah. any point in, in there. Um, yeah. But uh, this would be a good example of kind of a more massive system. Now, another light curve that if someone's looked at a lot of light curves on Planet Hunters test, for example, uh, and they might have come across this, would be a light curve that looks something like this. This is quite messy. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot of kind of up and down motion. And this is caused by star spots. Star, star spots. Can, what are star spots? Is it just what it sounds like? There are spots on the star? There are, that's exactly what it is. 
Cooler spots on the star, is that what it is basically? Okay. Yeah, cooler or hotter spots on the star. Um, mm. So if you, our sun has them too. So our sun has spots on it. These are darker spots, um, but these spots move around as the sun, our sun in our case rotates, the spots also move around with it. So this is exactly the same. This is a star uh, that isn't our sun. This star has spots, it actually has multiple spots. Um, yeah. And these spots come and go, which is causes these kind of increases and decreases in the brightness that we see here. Wow. Now, the reason why I wanted to show all of these different types of variabilities, like the spots that we have here, uh, even eclipsing binaries, flares, is because they all make the detection of planets more difficult. So anything that is in the light curve, whether they are periodic or not, makes it more challenging to find those small dips that we expect from planets. So an example here is this is, I wanna say this is an eclipsing binary, um, but here we have large scale variability caused by spots. So these large up and down motions, this is caused by spots on the surface of this star. Mm -hmm. Now there are also transitive or eclipses in here. We have one eclipse here and we actually have another one down here, but it's quite difficult to see these eclipses because this star is so variable and because there are all these other signals in here too. Now I wanna say this is an eclipsing binary. These are eclipses due to another star, which means that those are deeper. But now imagine that, that this, these eclipses are due to a planet. Those would be almost impossible to detect and they'd be even more difficult to detect because of this variability. Um, so just something to, to keep in mind when we have this variability, these kind of these transit events by the by both stars and planets are more difficult to detect. And that's also why citizen science is so important because we can, when we look at these by eye, we can kind of filter out this large scale variability just by looking at it. But for machines, it can be quite difficult to do that, which is why citizen science is so important to detect. Um, and why it's great to have a good citizen science community because things like this can be flagged and people can, more people can, more eyeballs can look at it and people can come to it and bring their own things and say, oh, this is that, or I saw this in a previous example. So this is why it's important and why you guys are so important to be part of this as citizen scientists and to continue to build this amazing community with mm -hmm. the citizen scientists. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, so those are just some examples of, of the types of variable stars. There are lots of different types of variable stars. You have zones on that HR diagram where you expect really high pulsation stars, uh, where literally the entire star just uh, increases and decreases in size and you, you get these really large scale variabilities and we can talk about those um, another time. And that all depends on where it falls on that diagram that we talked. That HR diagram is really, really important to understand the kind of variability that you expect, the kind of systems you expect, and therefore whether you expect to be able to find a planet around that type of star. Um, so yeah, it's really important. Good examples. And I like um, that you called this, this is just a recipe. There are probably other examples and other things out there. So this is not the end all be all, but these are just some stereotypical type of examples that Nora showed you today. So, okay, great. Nora, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about for the star variability or are we gonna close out this episode for today? I think that's it for today. Um, if you see exciting stellar variability on Planet Hunter's test, do flag it. Uh, you can use hashtags. Um, they're always fun to, to look into and to, to see what's happening with, with the stars. Great. Well, thank you very much, Nora, for all of your amazing information as always. And I'm really happy to be back. Uh, thank you very much again, Nora. And thank you again for joining us. Uh, we will have future episodes, of course, talking about different bits with stars and of course with the planets and light curves. But as always, please reach out to us. Let us know anything that you would like for us to delve into and talk about. Um, we are here for you. So thank you very much for joining us. And until next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.